Welcome to another episode of the Life Sciences Professional Podcast. I'm very excited to introduce Patrick Asada, who is a Senior Director of Human Resources at Baxter Corporation. He's had a number of years in the medical device industry, both in a marketing capacity as well as human resources. I think our guests will truly enjoy his perspective of what it's been like to make the transition from marketing over to human resources, but even more importantly, what candidates should see from the perspective of a human resource professional when they're being interviewed and some tips that they'll learn from him so that they can interview more effectively. Um, Help me introduce Patrick and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks for joining. Well, thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. Really excited to have you. I know that um, the guests will really enjoy your perspective, you know, just as we were talking that there's so many things that candidates are a little uncertain of when it comes to being interviewed by corporate uh, recruiters. And, you know, it's different than being interviewed sometimes by an external recruiter like myself. So I'm um, looking forward to our chat today. But before we get started, if you don't mind sharing a bit about yourself, you know, personally and professionally, just so candidates get uh, a good understanding of your background, that'd be awesome. Thanks, Linda, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. I, I always enjoy talking with you and, and having a chance to uh, share some thoughts with your listeners is a, is a great opportunity for me as well, both personally and professionally. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about me. I, I work with Baxter. I'm the um, Associate Director for Human Resources here. Um, this is my second tour of duty, which is pretty neat, uh, working with uh, some people here that I've known from years ago. So there's a high degree of familiarity, but you know, um, I last worked here nine years ago, so there's a lot of changes as well. So it's kind of a nice, nice, nice blend of the familiar and the uh, the new. Um, so, and I've worked in the healthcare business uh, and and the food business for many, many years. I won't say how many, but uh, it's been <laughs> decades. I can measure it in decades. Um, I, I, I originally worked in human resources and labor relations in Newfoundland, the food industry, and then, um, and, and then moved to different capacities. So I guess I have an unusual background in terms of, I haven't been a lifer in human resources. I've had opportunities to work in, in uh, retail store operations uh, roles as well as in marketing. Uh, but my true love is in human resources, and I found myself back here in the last um, uh, ten or eight to ten years. So, uh, but I think what it has given me is an interesting lens from a from a manager's perspective or from a commercial uh, perspective. So um, I, I think that in a lot of ways I'm probably a, a a wiser HR business partner than I may have been at the beginning, and certainly a, a more uh, broader. Um, rounded individual uh, in that regard. Uh, I have a BCom from Memorial University in Newfoundland, an MBA from the University of Toronto. And um, yeah, just uh, hopefully I can give you some some good perspective to you and your listeners. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I know, um, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot in conversations with candidates, and you and I have had this conversation before too, but you know, when candidates are applying to corporate websites for a job Um, or it could even be like LinkedIn you know when you post for a role and they don't hear back could you give like uh, two three tips maybe candidates could do or maybe understand why they might not be getting a response and sometimes they say you know I'm not getting a response it's just gone into a black hole what do I do What, what do you suggest candidates do so that they understand number one why they might not be getting a response you know volume you and i've had this conversation or you know two if they think they're a really good candidate and they feel that maybe they're not standing out or they want to get seen what should they do well first of all let me explain why that may happen at times i can just give the 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 candidates um uh, some perspective so sometimes especially when you're dealing with an internal recruiter um you know, the, the plan is always to fill a role quickly, but there could be many, many reasons why there could be delays and it has nothing to do at all with the candidate at all. While that, that may be easier to kind of come to that conclusion from the candidate perspective. But it could be something similar, uh, simply that the TA person is overwhelmed by the number of applicants, because certainly when you when you post, you get hundreds of applicants from all around the world, let alone the, you know, the immediate area or the province. 
And you may have a very busy hiring manager who has to filter through them as well. And, and that person may or may not be as, as successful as they had hoped they would be. And it could be even other pressures, for example, a role that was approved may, an organization may have some, you know, especially with a publicly traded company, some short-term business financial constraints that a role may be put on hold. So there could be many reasons why a role could be put on hold that has nothing to do with the candidates. So some of these processes, they always take longer than, um, than intended. Um, so what can, candidates can do, I think the key is communication. Then while the company would always want to try to communicate to its candidates, is that always possible, especially the numbers are large. So I would, I would ask, I would suggest that um, the candidates try to reach out to the TA individual, certainly not daily, right? You know, but certainly if they were to check back, say after a week, after first bidding, just to kind of say, did you receive my application just to confirm that? Do you have any questions? I think that's fair. And then even if they were able to make contact, in case of the delay, is there a preference in terms of cadence that you would like me to um, to follow up with you? Because I'm really interested in that role. So that way they can get a sense of either the organization's culture or the TA's preference, uh, talent acquisition person's preference in terms of uh, what is the right uh, time length for follow-up to so make sure that they are on the radar but on the radar for the right reasons as opposed to being somebody who m may come across as being too over uh, exuberant that kind of thing so I think being able to have a introductory touch point and build a range with the TA is important I think uh, as well if, if especially in these days with LinkedIn and 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 networking if you know somebody within the organization or in your net in your LinkedIn network, if you know somebody who knows somebody in that organization, having an, another in or potentially a champion uh, uh, could be would be valuable in terms of giving you another entry or another contact point to distinguish yourself from again what could be hundreds, potentially even thousands of applications. So I think, you know, trying to use, especially for a role or an organization that you have great interest in, trying to use build relationships with either a, a talent acquisition specialist or uh, somebody within that organization who can help differentiate would be helpful. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, some candidates just assume and I, you know, they just apply and die, right? Yeah. So they don't take that extra effort to really help themselves along and they don't realize that the amount of applicants like we get people applying onto our website or if we post something that come from as you mentioned all over the world and and the volume can be astronomical and to get through them is just incredible yeah. so i think you know your point that you made it's not the candidate it's the volume no. and you know just to get through that sometimes it's just so um, overwhelming it's not funny so using your network as you said is important the other thing too is does your system if you know there some people are giving advice on resumes to you know put pictures on or you know do graphics and do all these things will your system kick that out good question I'm not familiar with the, the Baxter system and again I, I recently joined Baxter within the last yeah. year I was with Hill around for the previous four years um, and the Hill system didn't push anybody. I would doubt that the back system would push anybody out either. I think, but you know, to your point, a lot of these systems are automatically yeah. scanning resumes, and they're looking more for keywords. Yeah. Um, so sometimes a very capable individual with a strong resume may not have, for example, the keywords. So right. all the more reason to reach out and make contact. Because these these systems are getting better and better with each passing year, but they're certainly far from perfect. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think the idea of trying to at least have an initial reach out and build a rapport and an interest will get somebody beyond just even the familiarity. It does send a message that you are interested in that role and the organization, which again, if, if, if they go with if the organization goes with somebody else for that particular role, there may be another role soon after in the future that may come up. So the key is building up, building as many touch points as you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and helping with quality. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The um, another thing that we talked about too is, you know, you've interviewed somebody and um, they've gone through the interview process, 
And from a follow-up perspective, how soon after an interview should candidates send some correspondence thanking you for the interview? Well, so this is funny. Uh, you know, yeah. um, I'm always a, a topic you, you should always thank, especially an interviewer, because anybody who you deal with, but certainly um, an interviewer, like certainly within 24 hours, ideally same day. Um, that seems to be a lost art, when it really shouldn't be a lost art, it should be, almost be reflexive. Um, so, you know, if I were to estimate, I would say that um, over the last 10 years, if, if we get 10% thank yous, that's that's all we get. And maybe it's probably a lot less than that. Um, and, you know, hiring managers, um, those who are experienced in hiring and those who are less experienced, all comment on that. So, um, and it doesn't have to be a dissertation. Actually, dissertation would not be good, but just, <laughs> yeah. just a brief, a brief thank you. And ideally linking maybe one point of either something that would possibly in, in the interview that you could, uh, you know, reemphasize, or is it something that you think, well, maybe I said that the wrong way, or I, I came out the wrong way, even just a subtle clarification. It's a great excuse to be able to again, emphasize or to clarify a point that came up. So, you know, it should be, you know, as a general rule, three to four brief paragraphs, but it does make a, it does make a solid impression because it speaks to somebody's enthusiasm, somebody's professionalism, and, you know, inevitably all candidates, all employees deal with customers, whether it's external or internal customers. So it speaks to, yeah, an individual commitment to make relationships just, you know, uh, courtesy which, you know, in these days of first impressions, that's important. Yeah. And, and interest in the role, right? Yeah. The, um, it, it's, it really does speak to that. And also standing out. So you're saying like, you, you think like 10% of the candidates you're interviewing send it. So those 10% stand out. For I sure. have clients, uh, um, hiring managers, that if candidates don't send them, they'll eliminate them. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, you know, you probably have some managers that are sticklers on that as well, because if it's a sales role or a marketing role, they look at it from a, a follow up perspective. What are they going to be like with their clients? What are they going to be like exactly. with internal customers? So based on that, they, they feel that it's an eliminating factor. So it's something for candidates to consider and to be aware of that if you want to stand out and you want to demonstrate the way you would be, in your role, it's important, and not just for the first interview, for all interviews, right? No, no, no doubt, Linda. I mean, it's it. Time and time again, I'll hear a manager will say, for example, you know, for someone who didn't who didn't acknowledge, uh, or, or, or you know, I would respect some kind of a follow up, and that didn't happen, and and, and that's necessarily an old, a so called old school manager. That could be just somebody who even is 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 relatively new at, new in the game. So, um, I think it, it doesn't. Have, a detailed uh, follow-up is probably what might be a little bit of a distraction, but certainly some kind of follow-up. And like you say, especially for the commercial role, but again, even mm -hmm. for the internal roles, um, it does speak to um, how somebody just exercise basic you know, collaborative, collaborative skills or, and just even how they manage expectations and that, that kind of thing, manage relationships. So mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. those things, those things really should be you know, table stakes more than anything else. But it seems to be a distinguisher um, more and more, I'm finding. And, you know, we were talking about um, candidates and when they interview and, you know, you and I've worked together um, in terms of finding candidates for, for different roles. A lot of times they're, they're higher level roles, but, you know, candidates sometimes don't recognize whether they're on the phone or Zoom or in person, what's really important in terms of how they present themselves. So what advice would you give candidates in terms of things that they want to make sure that they're aware of? You know, it could be yes. tone, it's all those things. What what advice would you give candidates? So um, I, I think that, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, like this is a, in a lot of ways, it's a lot like dating, I suppose, although I really shouldn't say a whole lot because I've been married for 31 years. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, 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 it, again, it's, it's a lot about first impressions, rightly or wrongly, it's about first impressions. Because, you know, you, again, if you're dealing with 
dozens, hundreds of thousands of candidates, and in a lot of cases, a lot of very strong candidates, not only quantity, it's quality. Um, those first impressions are critical. So it, it comes down to uh, confidence and, and presence in terms of, you know, how, for example, concise are you with communication? That's often a, a downfall. So how do you communicate in a fulsome way, but in a concise way? So, you know, the, the classic 30, the 60 second elevator speech would be uh, key, especially with a human resource person who would not be technically, you know, deep in, in the, for example, in an engineering subject matter as the candidate. So you want to kind of keep it, know your audience. So um, keep the keep the conversation at as high a level, at least starting out. And if the interviewer, whether it's HR or the hiring manager or, or another colleague, watch more details, they will follow up. And at that point, then you can certainly release more information. But um, keep the keep the information uh, as as general, just so that the other person can understand it, because they may not be technically proficient as again the, the candidate in the interviewee would be. I think it's just general thing that again it, it sounds cliche, but eye contact um, and just exuding, you know, a a a, a balance of confidence, but also a balance of listening as opposed to somebody who just spouts out and does a brain dump in terms of a, a question for example um so i think the key is, is to be concise in communications have a strong sense of presence in terms of in the moment listening answer the question concisely and just just you know give a sense of what you would be like as a co-worker as somebody who has frontline responsibilities to customers just so that they get a sense in terms of you as a person, in addition to I guess, your technical knowledge and experience. And focus on your achievements. Don't focus so much on responsibilities or duties, but really focus on achievements. That's what employers want to hear, is what you did and how you, you did in terms of achievements, as opposed to just the day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you think back to different scenarios where you've interviewed candidates and you think, oh my gosh, they got to stop doing that. Yeah. You know, where I've been phone interviewing or Zoom interviewing, I can hear clicking. And I'll say, them, are yeah. you clicking a pen? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, how'd you know that? And I'd say, I can hear it, right? So they're nervous, obviously, but it's, it's being aware of some things they're doing or, you know, they're like constantly looking up right when they're answering you they look up at things like that that they're not aware that they're not really looking at you when they're speaking just different things like that or smiling like smiling when you're on the phone smiling when you're um on zoom or in person that they don't realize that they're so nervous and tense they're not smiling so i always say to candidates you know just be yourself just relax yeah. and be yourself because yeah. if you are pretend you're talking to a friend talking to a colleague that you know just try and relax a little bit so that you can just speak naturally because you, that's who you're going to be when they hire you absolutely so and, and see that right yeah and 99.9 percent .9 of the world do that naturally yeah. of course you know it's easier said than it's easier to do it in this kind of a form with somebody yeah. you know but yeah. um when it comes to an interview people tend to i mean again i've talked about first impressions but if you be your natural self that actually can be quite helpful. Now, the key is do, doing research about the company and, and, and having that in your, in your in your back pocket. But I think the idea of being yourself and being able to converse as you normally would will, will be helpful. And I think with, especially with more and more use of Zoom, kind of yourself in the camera here, more, more, you know, on the, screen versus <laughs> the camera lens here, I think you kind of, kind of see it um, there up front. But I, I think just carry the conversation as you normally would. Um, and show that you care. I think, you know, because that's what people, that's what employers, HR people, or hiring managers want to see. If people who have a passion, bring a passion for what they do day in, day out. And if you can exhibit that, um, hopefully that's, that's who you are. But if, if you can exhibit that in an interview, um, it really is, it adds to just the, the nuts and bolts of what the hard skills of what you bring to the role. Right. It's that like and trust factor, right? That you're looking for them to come across so that uh, 
you know, that's people, it's like you, you referred to earlier when you're answering the question, it's like dating, right? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. exactly. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do I want to hear it? <laughs> yeah. Do we want you or not? <laughs> no. But, um, you know, the other thing that we do all day, and then that's look at resumes. And over the years, you know, you've come across lots of different resumes. Are there any tips that you could give individuals in terms of the do's and don'ts around resumes in, in order for them to, you know, be seen? You know, there's some things that people do with resumes that are great. And there are other things that you see and you think, ooh, you know, we talked about that, you know, errors and stuff like that, but you just, you want to just highlight for them. Yeah, so, you know, people out there in podcasts that may not realize this and certainly as I returned back to HR after being in on the commercial side it it really for some reason I thought things had changed but um, people I still see far more often than not I see errors in resumes and multiple errors in resumes in terms of for example particularly and the grammar and the spelling uh, whether it's in resumes or the cover letters and it just over and over again. And, you know, um, again, right there, Roddy, I mean, so for some folks, for some hiring managers, they have a zero t tolerance policy and they will dismiss it. Because again, you know, while somebody might say, well, that's awfully picky and arbitrary. Again, if you're trying to make the first, a, a best impression, that's, the, that's, the, that's one of the messages you should be giving when you when you present yourself either in a written or in a personal form like this. Um, it just it it, it 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 can turn off um, a, a sort of a high performing manager. So I think it, it, it kind of speaks perhaps to the quality of their day to day workmanship uh, as they as they as they proceed through work. So if this is how they are on their first impression or best impression, what are they like day to day? So I think just taking the care to review uh, cover letters and resumes just to make sure and. And some of these mistakes can be sometimes um, a, a, a spell checker wouldn't pick it up, like the classic mm -hmm. there, there, and there, whether it's T-H-I-E-R or T-H-E-R-E, -E, for example, or the contraction form. So um, just take care on that. Second thing is to really, like in the interview, focus on achievements. I mean, again, for some roles, that may be hard to do because some roles are not easily quantifiable like other roles. but. If you can speak to achievements, to um, uh, awards that you may have received, or accolades in terms of comments from colleagues or managers that you can kind of, you know, um, uh, flesh out, or um, you know, for some companies they have um, employee recognition programs where peers can, you know, give accolades to uh, to colleagues. So those kinds of things, and there are recurring themes that you can speak to. Uh, and that's why I think what people, that's what employers want to hear is both hard achievements and just those soft skills to be emphasized. Um, so I think, again, focusing on achievements is, is key. And I guess the third thing, again, is conciseness that, um, you know, we, we, sometimes you get resumes that, you know, I know people get worried about whether it should be two or three pages. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of that, in my opinion, is based on experience. But um, let, let's say, for example, if somebody has three years experience and they've got a 10 page resume <laughs> that includes dissertations and, and, you know, especially if they've done graduate work that may, depending on the role, I guess some roles may appreciate that, but for the vast majority of roles, that's not what the employer is looking for. And again, they want something a little more concise. What you're trying to do with that resume and cover is trying to get into the door to get an interview. In, so let yourself let you, you know sell yourself what to get into the interview, but give enough uh, on that resume that they have reasons to um, uh, to want to talk to you. And that's a function of achievements matched to job requirements. So sh show them why you are in why uh, you're interested in the role and what evidence you have in your experience and in your achievements that would make them want to interview you or that they, they need to interview you. It's interesting you say that because so often um, I see resumes and it doesn't show any successes, right? It's a job description. Yes. So they write the resume totally based on their job description year after year after year. And I, and it's as if nobody coached mm -hmm. them around or asked them the question, well, what did you, 
accomplished? What were your successes? Nobody asked them. And they've obviously interviewed before that. So I, I, I think that that's an excellent point. It's really important because that's what hiring managers want to know is, you know, what contributions have you made in the past that you could possibly bring to our organization, right? What are your exactly. skills, soft and hard? What are your successes? You know, history repeats itself. That's the belief. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, um, you know, that they're looking for someone to, to contribute to their organization like they did somebody else's. So it's really important. Um, you know, the, the other thing too, is that I've seen people copy other people's resumes just from a template perspective, right? And, and make the mistake of not eliminating things, you know, by accident, oh, okay. right? So I think it's important, you yeah. know, be very careful. You know, you want to have a good resume, be very careful when you're doing those things and that you really check. And there's also a tool called Grammarly, you know, speaking of the yes. talent, Grammarly is very helpful because you can cut and paste everything in your resume, put it into Grammarly, check it. And then also have somebody else read your resume. Yes. Not your mother, not your brother or sister, <laughs> have somebody, a colleague or yes. something read your resume, someone you trust to look it over to see it from 40,000 feet above to say, you know, how does this read any recommendations you have in it? It should be someone with experience so that they can look at it from a different perspective. That's another thing they could do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No. yeah. I mean, you know, I know, for example, uh, when I'm writing um, an email or, or a paper, sometimes you get so caught up in the moment that after a while you lose objectivity because you've yeah. invested so much time and so much thought into it. So having a, a different set of eyes who, who you know, who had done that investment can, uh, of time in, in that particular uh, piece can, can give really good insights. And, and again, you know, the interviewer or the hiring manager um, is, a, is a different set of perspectives. So having that, you know, uh, different perspective would be very valuable. And, and I, I would recommend that, that people take advantage of that if they can. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And um, I know another question that candidates often get asked, and they think, well, I don't know how to answer this question. Like, it's just, where do I start? What do I say? Is tell me about yourself. How how do you think candidates should answer that? Um, you know, that that's interesting. I mean, um, because different organizations have different practices and 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 i think it, it comes down to understanding what an organization organization's culture is so let me kind of just do a little bit of a tangent so when you are asking questions you should ask questions about um a company's culture because some companies are far more by the book they want to just focus on what you know what you do how you kind of to the organization others want to know about you as a person what are your personal interests and, and sometimes within an organization, you can have different people who have different approaches in an interview. Some people, are, again, will be very mm -hmm. free-forming, freestyling, and, and want to know more about that individual because it's, again, it, it, it's almost like, you know, for a lot of our, a lot of the, uh, our, of our coworkers, they become very close friends, not just colleagues. So, um, it, again, mm -hmm. that, that dating or, or friendship analogy is, is, is very important. So, so I think that um, I would certainly focus as a general rule, focus more on your experience and your achievements vis-a-vis -vis the job requirements. Um, and then follow the lead of the interview. If the interviewer asks, you know, tell me a bit about yourself personally, then you can uh, you can certainly expand that. And, and what the, you know, hopefully in these you know, employers are well and, and managed are well aware that you can't ask certain questions about, you know, marital status and background, mm -hmm. but even though the intent may be genuine you still can't ask that question because it's always a perception that decision can be made for you know uh the wrong reasons but you know if, if it's something about interest whether it's uh, sports cooking traveling reading it, it you know let's say reading as an example it, it may be a very interesting um uh tangent that to see if there's a connection that can be made because again while employers are looking for the hard skills that's certainly you know paramount they, they, a lot of employers will want to know what, what personal connections they can have one on one and with the team at the broader team in terms of how will that chemistry fit. If they've got a great culture, they'll probably want somebody who's either 
uh, you know, who can fit well with the team. And if they want somebody who can be, you know, maybe more um, uh, questioning the, the, you know, the current practices, they may go with somebody who has more of that orientation. So, so, so I think, you know, follow the lead of the, you know, I would stick with the role background versus a job requirements. But then if, if the interviewer asks more questions, then certainly feel free to go there. But of course, be, be aware where, where things may, you know, especially if somebody's type of, you know, family, you know, kind of uh, situations, you know, those, those would be things that you'd want to watch out for because certainly an organization should be asking those types of questions. Mm -hmm. Or, and, yeah, and it is a tough one, right? And you can also say, you know, where would you like me to begin or, or uh, prof yeah. professionally, um, where would you like me to begin? Something like that. Uh, so then the person can say, oh, well, you can start from university and bring me up to now in two minutes or whatever. So you're kind of asking clarification on, you know, what is it you want me to talk about? And if they say, well, personally, you can just say, well, personally, I like to play sports, just like you're saying that, um, you know, I'm, I'm an avid reader, I jog, like I know things about you like that that, you know, those are things I like to do and uh, in my free time, but quite honestly, I'm, you know, quite passionate about my work and my career. And, um, you know, that's really, I'm team, I play team sports, but I also love right. to golf. So it's uh, when the summer months come, I can't wait to get out on the golf course, like summer, which is not me, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, I know that. It's not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not me <laughs> that's, my, that's my family. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but whatever, the, you know, there's yeah. ways they could do it, but to your point, but I always um, suggest shying away from, you know, I'm a mother of three boys. I right. never, I remember for the first number of years, my boss said, you know, you're like, nobody knows anything about your family. Right, that even whether you're married, yeah. Yeah. and um, I said, "Well, why is that important?" <laughs> he said, "Well, because they don't think you're human," and because uh, <laughs> I worked a lot and was, yeah. you know, pretty successful, and then yeah. I realized that, you know, maybe I better let them know me a little bit, yeah. um, kind of change that a little bit. But uh, that, I was young, and you yeah. know, it's just I was out doing my thing. But uh, you kind of learn from experience that you're. Team members want to know a little more about you in terms of your family and that kind of stuff so it's kind of sure. interesting yeah yeah so um one of the other things that i get questions a lot about and i would love your perspective on this is that salary you know what are your salary expectations from from your your perspective when you ask that question what are you really looking for candidates to say do you do you want them to tell you um, where they are now or what they're hoping to earn. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, that, that is, for me, the, the hardest question because you, you can ask 10 different HR people and you'll get 10 different answers. There's, there's no uniformity on that. It's, it's really, I mean, the reason why um, an, an HR person or for that matter, a hiring person or interviewer would ask is, Obviously, you know, no, no, no big secret is, is if somebody is asking for too much than what the role is budgeted for, then it becomes a self-selection piece out. So, um, and that, that that works both ways. If, if if somebody is advanced in their career, and this is a, you know, from a salary perspective, a junior or a lesser role, role they've posted mm -hmm. to entry level, then we're, we're only wasting the candidate's time in most cases. Um, as well, so it is a question you have to really be very cautious about. I mean, the general approach that I would, uh, so, so that's why the employer is asking. Um, I, I guess the secondary reason I should ask why employers ask is just to see how, again, this varies from organization to organization, but is the individual financially driven? And for some roles, Mm -hmm. Especially in sales, that's exactly what you, what you may want. It's the classic, you know, to use the the street term that's used for um, is, is somebody who's a hunter in terms of an aggressive sales mm -hmm. versus somebody mm -hmm. who's probably a, a, a little more laid back. Um, but I think for most roles, most organizations, they want somebody who um, may not be in this only for, for a transactional purpose, but but they're in this 
either for the longer haul or at least for a reason that they're going to stay around for a while and contribute because it obviously takes a tremendous investment and time to get somebody up to speed and get them going. So, so I think they want, in general, most companies want people who are committed as opposed to being, you know, transactional a year or two into a role, then a year or two out of the organization kind of thing. So, um, so, so, so I think that that's, I would say that focus, uh, the idea would be to focus and from the tech perspective, it, you know, I'd rather focus on the culture and focus on the chemistry between us and, and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, or, or say that it depends really on, as I learn more about the role. Now, if a company is really, or the interview is really more insistent there and ask for, can you, can you, you know, we really need to know. And you, again, you know why they need to know. Um, is I would suggest you give a range of your expectations as opposed to your current salary. Um, I know in the U.S., it's in, at least in, in many states, you really can't ask for a current salary. In yeah, Canada, right, yeah. you, you 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 have more latitude there. But I would focus more on uh, in some ways it's really immaterial what you're making today, at least in terms of at least for preliminary conversations, is what your expectations are. And, and I would give a range and give a fairly wide range so you don't self-eliminate yourself out on the low end, but you uh, but you leave yourself on the top end that you um, you negotiate. So, and then, but then and then after you give it a range, you know, but this is really I'm, I'm really more interested in the job, the role, the responsibility, the challenges, the details, and I'd like to kind of discuss this more, um, you know, at, at the appropriate time. And then you can ask if you, you know, is, is does this fit with your needs, so that you can make sure that you didn't eliminate yourself. Because it may be a role that is so important to you that you might be willing to take a, a slight hit, for example, if there's a opportunity for a promotion down the road, or just an, an industry or a field or a role that you really want to, you know, grab in. So, so I would say, you know, if you're going to give, if you're preferring a, a um, a range, a, a number, give a range, and then ask, because it, it, you're as much in the driver's seat as the interviewer. Like this is a two-way street. Ask, does, does that range fit with the needs and with how this role is rated or how, what, what has been approved for this role? And that way you will get a sense that this is in your range as, as well as they'll get a sense to where you sit. And then you can kind of adjust if you need to, or if that's a way for you to bow out because it's not what meets your needs then you can, um, it, it's a good time to then lower your expectations as well. Yeah, and, and I think that, that, that that's excellent, Patrick, because really, and they can come right out and say too, you know, I'm extremely interested in the role. Um, my, my income needs, my minimum income needs are, you know, X, yeah. say, I'm gonna say 150,000. I do currently make more than that, but in order for me to make my household expenses, mm -hmm. this is what I need. But I'm I'm happy to further have further conversations as I'm extremely interested in the opportunity. And I'm I'm if that is within your budget, you know, 150 to 200 is within your budget. Um, you know, I'd be interested in learning more if if um, that's within your budget and. Um, I, I believe I'm a great candidate for the role and I'd like to continue in the interview process if that's um, suitable to you. But right. what I say to candidates all the time is if you go below your expenses or what's comfortable to you, one right. year, two years down the road, when the job becomes stressful or at some point you will be unhappy, it happens in every job for a period Absolutely. of time, right? Yeah. then all of a sudden that money that you gave up does start to wane on you and bother you. Yeah. The company invests a lot of money, huge money, for every employee they hire. And they don't want to lose you. They want to invest in you. They want to succession their employees wherever possible. And you don't want to have another turnover. So no. don't take a job where you're stepping back always step exactly. forward, right? Exactly. So yeah. that's the advice I always give candidates to really think about it. And sometimes they'll take a job that's less money because they're really unhappy where they are. Yeah. And I always say, you know what, a good job will come along. Don't, you know, run away from something, run to something that's positive. 
Yep. So, yep. you know, I'm, I'm always nervous when I hear candidates say, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm willing to take a pay cut, but look at how much things have gone up in price, food, expenses, like living expenses. So somebody that did that six months ago is really feeling the pain now, right? So I always guide people, to, you know, be very careful. It's your career, it's your life. But in the 20 so much years I've been doing this, I know that people really struggle when they make a decision like that. And because the benchmark for future, for future roles as well, you know, because um, yeah. you, obviously you, you want to continue to rise, but you know, I mean, the other thing too is it's always a nuanced conversation. If if the salary level question comes up late, now if you're in the second or even third interview, yeah. that salary number comes up, you probably have a bit more leverage at that point. Yeah, because clearly they, they've shown an interest. So um, and that's when that range uh, becomes either a small a lar that larger range becomes a smaller range or becomes a more precise number. But have a good idea as to what you're looking for, not only based on your needs, but if you can do some research online, salary.com, if I can say yeah. that, or others, um, th so that you have a sense as to what, an objective sense uh, as to what a, a role like that is to be valued. So you're not surprised. Yeah, I think that's great advice. So one last question, any advice you give to an individual that's looking to get into the industry in sales or marketing or um, operations or anything that you can recommend that from an interviewing perspective? Yeah, it, it's interesting, you know, because I mean, if, if there's one thing that, that has really changed, I find um, over the last 10 years, at least my experience, again, I don't know what kind of a sample size it is, is I think companies are more and more thinking out of the box than they have in the past. So I think the old model, especially in the healthcare industry, is healthcare industry experience is paramount. And dare I say this, that um, the medical device and the pharmaceutical side, if you drill down even a little further, is even more cemented. So they would be seen as two separate industries, especially on the commercial side. And a medical device person is a medical device person is a medical device person, and the same thing on the pharmaceutical side. I think um, in this day and age, what I'm finding is that more and more people are open to track records in different industries. So I realize mm -hmm. that industry to industry is very different. So, for example, uh, in the healthcare business, especially my end of the healthcare business, a lot of it is RFP or five year, 10 year contract based, whereas in the retail, it's kind of what have you done for me lately kind of thing. <laughs> transactional, it's, it's, yeah. Very, very yeah. transactional. Yeah. Three um, for one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, I, I would say that, especially with, and I do see a lot of people who want to come into healthcare for a whole variety of reasons, whether it's uh, want to be part of something that they believe be more meaningful and, and mission oriented to just being a perception of being recession proof or whatever. Um, I think focus on the track record. A is, is that uh, what have you done, especially if you have received award accommodations, focus on that because for I think hiring managers, especially hiring managers who have an orientation of being open to um, to people who are outside the industry. I think focus mm -hmm. on track record and hopefully if you have that kind of track record, track record there is a presence about you um that really uh you know i know that uh, we've hired for example recently in the last couple of years the people who are from outside the industry and going into it we were thinking more you know, more of the same but they just blew us away not only their track record but just their sales approach and again i'm focusing on sales here but their methodologies and just their dare i say charisma that like you referring was, to like information technology or the spirits industry or uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, consumer packaging, like what, what exactly? Yes, yeah. consumer yeah. packaging would be, would be would be an obvious one, and yeah. we actually hired somebody uh, within the last uh, month uh, from the consumer package industry because they had that, you know, I, I hate to say it factor. I guess I just said it, yeah. but they yeah. just had something about them that you said, well, you know what, I, uh, I can take a chance here, and I've got a, a team of experienced people who can help, you know, shepherd this person along. So. Well, before, I don't think that would have even been in the conversation. They, they would have been eliminated early on. So I think if you have 
a track record and you have a, a, a natural hunger that can be communicated, whether by word, by physical data, telepathically, um, uh, that I think that, you know, it will turn the head. But the key is to get into that, get into an interview and whether that's done through a well curated resume, cover letter and the appropriate follow ups. It can be done, and my sense is, is that employers are more open to it. They have a default, but that default is not as regimented or as rigid mm-hmm. as it once was. Yeah, and there's, you know, a lot of people are exiting the industry, right? And there's also big growth within the industry. So, yeah. you know, we're, we can't, there's not enough talent for all the companies to have. And, you know, for right. years, we've, we've cross-pollinated and brought individuals um, from other industries two companies right that's what we specialize and we look for and we also bring up and coming athletes and science graduates and so forth that have the potential and we have companies that have um, mentorship programs for those individuals so they bring them up in the organization to do that but the ones that we present to our, our clients what makes them different and kind of like the wow factor it factor that you're talking about they research the industry You know, they do all the things they need to do to make sure that when they are interviewing, um, they can speak about the products. They understand uh, the go-to market. They've talked to candidates, they've job shadowed, they've done a bunch of things so that when they do go to the interview, you know, and the hiring manager says, well, what do you, you know, what do you know about the industry? Why do you want to work in the industry? They can say, you know, I've done all this research not you know my uncle works in the medical industry and he said i should be in it you can't say that right no you got to validate that you've done your own research so you know i've had candidates that have said well you know my my brother-in-law does it and says it's a great industry makes lots of money well you know yeah so no. <laughs> you go away and you go do a bunch of research and let's have a chat so you know it's yeah. and the ones that do it they're fantastic or if they come from the spirits industry or information tech technology or you know systems all of those industries it, it's a healthcare is a great transition for them so yeah. and, and you really know you know i haven't spent much time on this you, you've addressed a couple of times earlier on um, but you you really know when somebody has researched the company. I mean, and, and, and uh-huh. the flip side, you really know when somebody has researched the company. Because <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it's very clear uh, by their answers, even though they may have said earlier on they did, they did their research. Yeah. Because yeah. um, after I'll have a, a hiring manager who will say, uh, as, as a prelude early on, so have you researched our company? And invariably the answer is yes. And then minor questions are just not. Yeah. Uh, asked and, and it, you know you, you tell the interest wanes dramatically you can feel the temperature in the room uh you know get colder quickly but um you know it, it and, and you know i had an, an uncle uncle i mentioned an uncle earlier. i had an uncle when i was a lowly university undergrad student uh, who he was experienced in hiring and he said you know what he would recommend uh people doing and 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 he said well and again this was you know, too many the decades ago <laughs> so well, i would go to the local uh, bar and 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 see where people hang out and talk to them well fortunately you don't have to do that anymore there's something called again linkedin social network yeah and you'll be surprised as to how many people it won't be 100 percent of people but you'll be surprised to how many people will be willing to uh, um, talk to you uh, over a cup of coffee or even just a phone call or a, mm-hmm. Zoom, call or a Zoom call and just share their experience. You know, again, if you can connect with somebody, either because you have a network or you just cold call somebody, look, I'm interested in joining. I work with a CPG company or a spirits company. I'm interested in moving to healthcare. Can you tell me a bit about your the industry? And you can learn a lot about culture and learn a lot about whether well, this is an organization for you or an industry for you. And just, you know, what would they be asked for an interview? And what, you know, not that money is everything for me, but give me a sense, of, to give me a range in terms of what you would think this role would be worth. And you either do it, you know, um, after you've applied for a role, if you're interested in applying, or you do it, you know, proactively before you even apply mm-hmm. for a role and just kind of say, if this company interests me, you know, would you be interested in, meeting with me again it won't be a hundred percent but you'd be surprised to how many people would 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 be 
more than willing to help because you know, for most people they, they were there as either a recent graduate or somebody in between gigs or somebody who just wants to change you might just connect with somebody who'd be willing to give you all kinds of you know great intel to help you in your strategy whether you want to pursue a role pursue a company or whether you want to go in a different direction yeah absolutely it, people do want to help and uh, they're more than open to doing that through linkedin or or you'll know, be surprised you have a neighbor that's in the industry and you didn't even know it, right? So exactly. be surprised. Exactly. But yep. well, Patrick, I, I really appreciate all your insights and I'm sure that our listeners have too. And uh, you know, good luck at uh, in your role, especially finish up the year end. I'm sure you're yes. slammed right Everybody's now. Scrambling. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's great. Well, thank you, Linda. It's, oh, it's a great opportunity to, to talk and uh, see, uh, see you again. And uh, best of luck to you and best of luck to your listeners and viewers. Thank you. You have a great day. Yeah, you too. Bye. Take care. Bye.